What is going on, guys? Welcome back to the FL Team's YouTube channel. And today we have a special episode, a special edition of FL Teams. And it's not just one special episode. It's going to be coming to you every single day. Welcome to the new Florida Sports Daily Podcast, the Sunshine State Sports Rundown. My name is JJ Metz, of course, and I will be your host for these daily podcast on the Sunshine State, talking all about sports in the Sunshine State. We have MLB, we have NBA, we have NFL, NHL, and college. We're going to cover everything. This is going to be your number one source for everything, everything Florida teams. We're going to be bringing you podcasts every day, special guests coming on, highlights and content from the game over me rambling and and, and yapping and talking about Florida sports. But thank you guys coming and listening, and we hope this can start something special. So today is August 19th. It is Monday, August 19th, and you know what that means. College football is around the corner. We have games this Saturday. It's Monday. We have games this Saturday. A local team, a team we're going to be talking about this week, Florida State is playing this Saturday. Other teams in the state of Florida are playing next week. College football is so near us, and it's closer than any other sport. Obviously, we're going to give you some baseball content, as as that will be coming around. That That's the sport right now. But we have college football coming up, and it is so close. We are just so close. So we're going to give you a rundown for these this week on pretty much every team in Florida in, in, in college. So we're going to go through FIU, FAU, all the way up to Florida, Florida State, Miami, UCF, and USF. We're going to cover it all for you. So this is the place to be. So before we get into it, subscribe. Please subscribe. Please. Our goal is to reach 1,000 subscribers. Now, obviously, you can always unsubscribe. And, and and also, make sure you guys like the video. If you do like it, obviously, going to give you guys a chance to, to watch through it. We're just a bunch of Florida sports fans that love talking sports. So make sure you join the community. We're on the road to 1,000 subscribers. You are watching the Sunshine State Sports Rundown, a daily podcast on Florida teams. So today, we're going to be focusing on Miami football. And Miami football is a team that's very intriguing. We saw two years ago them make the change, firing Manny Diaz, their former head coach, to now having someone like Mario Cristobal, a Miami alum with experience at the Power 5 level, as he coached at Oregon. Now, did he succeed at Oregon? He coached Justin Herbert well. He coached a lot of talent, but he wasn't able to get over that hump to win a national championship or make a college football playoff final appearance in Mario Cristobal's tenure at Oregon. Now he's at Miami, and I think it's pretty safe to say he has underachieved in his last two seasons with the Hurricanes. You look at a, a, a Miami team last year. They start the season 5-0. and They have Georgia Tech at home. They have the game in their hands. All they have to do is take a knee. What do they do? They run the football. They fumble Georgia Tech. It's a last-second home. Is that a coincidence? I, I think it's just Mario Cristobal and his coaching. And I'm going to tell you how it is. That's something you're going to get while watching this podcast. I'm not going to be like those other media people who, who, who say the things that fans want. That, that They say what you want to hear. They don't say what you need to hear. I'm going to say straight up, Mario Cristobal has failed in his two years at Miami. But year three is where it really, you, 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 you get taken to a next level, so to speak. And 
I would say, I'd say that this year is pretty much make or break for Mario Cristobal. You have a top 25 team in the country, obviously, in Miami. And you have a team that is loaded with talent in the transfer portal, which we're going to go over in just a second. But here's my thing. If you you have so much talent, but it's just coaching, you know, Mario Cristobal obviously making the hire of Josh or yeah, Josh Gates, I believe it was, from Michigan at the offensive coordinator position, which was I know I'm butchering his name, but at the offensive coordinator position, which uh no, it is Josh Gates. Yeah. Who who who's failed? Who's failed and, and their defense has failed. But no more Tyler Van Dyke. The days of Tyler Van Dyke are over. And Miami has figured out their quarterback position. They got someone like Cam Ward. And if you're not familiar with Cam Ward, I am going to tell you about Cam Ward. So Cam Ward, he transferred from Washington State. And he went lights out last season. When I tell you he went lights out, he was very good at Washington State last year and the years prior to that first off i'm going to start off with his near 4000 passing yards he had 37 i mean 3000 37 35 so 3735 uh that's nearly 3800 yards through the air and he's a better he is equally a scrambler with that. So having a dual threat guy like Kent Moore to scrambler is going to help 25 touchdowns to seven interceptions. That's a good rate. 65.2 QBR. You'd like to see that improve a little bit with his 66% uh, completion percentage. However, he's a guy who's thrown 300 plus yards. He, he, he's someone who, who can throw 300 plus yards. We saw him last year do that. And I feel as if he's going to do that at Miami this year, too. You know, the, the, the games that stand out to him, you know, he, he had the 450 plus yards versus Colorado State, 430 plus yards versus Oregon. So, so, so a quarterback who can throw through the air, rush on his own. Um, Yes, yeah, so excited for Cam Ward, and I'm sure Miami fans are too. You add arguably the best running back in the country, you know, other than I'm going to give it to Ollie Gordon, Donovan Edwards, but I would say the third best running back in college football, and this is my humble opinion, is Damian Martinez, transfer from Oregon State, a guy who is just speedy from the first step. You know, he, he's a halfback who can also take receptions, but he's mostly someone who's going to run it down your throat, and Miami's lacked that. You know, they, they've had some good running backs, but Damian Martinez is someone you can rely on. Mark Fletcher, another really good running back. I see what Miami's doing. Their talent is just so good but they can't produce. And you get guys in the transfer portal, you know, that are very good. You know, you get guys like Cam Ward, Damian Martinez, guys on the defensive end of the ball, which is super important, such as guys like, um, you know, A.J. Allen, another guy in the offensive end. But on defense, you have solid guys. Uh, Tyler Barron, another transfer you got. I believe, um, I believe, give me a second. Yeah, Marley Cook, transfer from Middle Tennessee. Someone who had the like, second highest scout grade on the defensive side of the ball for Miami. It's a solid team. And at wide receiver, you, you have arguably – a top five receiver in the country. Um, so, you know, this Miami team it, it has good wide receivers, has good running backs, has a good quarterback, has a very solid defense. Very solid defense. Um, a defense that it is top 
you know, 10, you have CJ Clark on the de- defensive end of the ball. Someone I, I, I trust at the um, defensive line, DT. And then Xavier Rushbrook, arguably the best wide receiver in the country. We saw him go off last season. Miami's a good team. They're a talented team, but can Mario Cristobal pull through? That's the deciding factor. And you know, I'm gonna pull this up in a second. We're gonna we're gonna pull this up in a second. However, we have a very, very special guest, Alex Dono, host of the Locked On Canes podcast. And he's gonna come to us right now. Alex, welcome back to the Sunshine State Sports Rundown. My name is JJ Metz and I am here with the voice of the Locked On Canes podcast, Alex Dono. Alex, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. JJ, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just excited for some football coming back. Yeah, and and we are too. You know, what has it been? It's been since the national championship game in in January uh, all the way until September. So great to have college sports coming on. And when the only sport is baseball in in summer – I mean, it's good to have some some football returning, some some basketball, college basketball around the corner of November. So really appreciate you, Alex. So first off, obviously, the, the main storyline before Miami football games starts are the scrimmages, are the fall camp, is all the practices going on before the games. So Miami fall camp recently just started two weeks ago. So from that fall camp, who has really stayed – you know, stood out to you, someone who has done better than most people expected and someone who you think could make a a huge impact on this Miami Hurricanes team come September? I'll start with the obvious choice because most important position is quarterback. And I think Miami's got a really good one uh, acquiring Cam Ward out of the transfer portal from Washington State. Uh, This is someone who has proven himself on the field, not just for the past two years at Wazoo, but past four years going back to his time at Incarnate Word, where he started his career. You know, he comes off a season where he threw for 3,735 yards, 25 touchdowns, and single-digit interceptions. Uh, you know, had had some fumbling issues, but I know he's been working on taking care of the football, not to mention having an improved offensive line because Washington State's O-line was not very good. Miami's is. And having weapons to throw the football to, I, you know, folks are expecting Cam Ward to have a, a really, really big year. It's why he's appearing on some of those Heisman Trophy watch lists and Maxwell Award watch lists. And I've seen him, JJ, uh, building really good chemistry with uh, his receivers like Xavier Restrepo, who had a 1,000-yard year last year, Jacoby George, uh, and he seems to really enjoy throwing to Isaiah Horton, who's kind of an up-and-coming receiver in Miami's rotation, and Sam Brown, who transferred in from Houston. So I I see some good connections there. Um, You know, several guys are standing out on defense. You know, I, I think I was having a conversation about this earlier. I think the defensive line may actually be the strongest unit on the entire Miami roster. You know, you have Ruben Hurricane Bain heading into his sophomore season. He was a co-leader in sacks with seven and a half last year. Did that as a true freshman. Uh, He's been really uh, hard to block in fall camp. Any offensive lineman you talk about is going to mention how going up against Ruben Bain in practice makes them better. And Nez Cooper, the starting right guard, was talking about that on the latest Canes Camp episode. And, you know, Miami's deep with edge rushers in addition to that. And a couple of guys that they acquired in the transfer portal, Elijah Alston from Marshall, put up huge numbers uh, with the Thundering Herd last year. And Tyler Barron from Tennessee uh, you know, faced SEC competition every single week and was one of the best pass rushers in college football. So guys like these are standing out. Kiko Maui Noah at linebacker. Uh, we already know from what he did last season at Miami, leading the team with eight with uh, 18 and a half tackles for loss, leading the team in tackles. I think he's going to have a really good year. And, you know, another element, JJ, that's going to make Miami's offense so dangerous. I'll circle back to that unit. Not only do you have Cam Ward at quarterback, but you've got a new stud running back uh, like Damian Martinez, who transferred in from Oregon State. He's also having a really good fall camp. In the second scrimmage, he popped off for about a a 60-yard touchdown that really spiked and juiced up the entire offense, and they kept playing well after that. 
Yeah, and you listed all the names on that Miami team. It's just so, so, so talented. Uh, you have Kim Ward, the, the transfer from Washington State. And as you mentioned, he had a great season last year. His weapon, Sam Brown, Xavier Restrepo, Isaiah Horton. And, and you mentioned the running back room, too. You know, you have Damian Martinez. And, and not only him, you have other guys in the room, Mark Fletcher, A.J. Allen. It may be one of the most stacked running back rooms in, in the country. But... Speaking of all that talent, it's something that Mario Cristobal has continued to be able to recruit. He is someone who can get talent, and, and, and there's no argument. He is great at getting talent and building rosters. But something that is a question is he hasn't been able to produce that talent. You know, we saw his tenure at Oregon, obviously then him leaving to his alma mater Miami, which the team we're talking about now, he hasn't produced at Miami. They won seven games last year, five games the year before. That's 12 wins, I believe, so far at, at Miami. And that's not up to expectations, going 12 and, and 8, was it? Or 12, I, no. 12 and 13, actually. 12 and so 13, yeah. 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 In, in his last two seasons, that's not what Miami fans expect. So are you confident that Mario Cristobal, entering his third season, he has his guys that – they can actually get over the hump and start winning and producing games because they're a top 25 team this year. The expectations are high, and they're always high. So are you confident he can do that? Well, it's the million-dollar question. It really is. So a a couple things need to happen for Miami to live up to or even exceed the expectations. The first thing is um, I I think you need to have – a very self-led locker room and and it's not, I'm not trying to diminish the role of a head coach, but I think for great teams, it's really the locker room. It starts with them. The buck stops inside the locker room. Obviously, you know, coaching is very important and we'll get to Mario Cristobal's role in this, but yeah, I think the idea of Miami's leadership council that players like Cam Ward and Jalen Rivers and Xavier Restrepo are are part of. I think that unit needs to become stronger because I think something Miami has lacked a lot of years when they had some not so great seasons was strong leadership from within. That if some of the veteran players start hanging their heads and checking out, then they're they're going to set the example down the entire roster. That can no longer happen. And then you know the other part of it is, um, and, and this this is one of the reasons why a lot of people out there have reservations about Mario Cristobal is, is he going to have, is he going to have some of those game time memes, right? Are you going to have a moment like not taking the knee against Georgia Tech? Are you going to have a moment where you have a tragic use or a a misuse of, of timeouts? It's something that we've seen, you know, we've seen rear its ugly head uh, a few times, uh, even going back to last year with Cristobal. I know that there has been some things written uh, and talked about with a lot of self-reflection going on within the coaching staff of trying to figure out ways to have more checks and balances late in games to you know improve you know the management. Final two minutes is always a really really big one that can make or break your entire football game. We saw what happened against Georgia Tech last year, so I'm I'm hoping that you know, and it's not just Cristobal, but the entire staff that they all look in the mirror and figure out the right ways to communicate, and if they have to figure out who the best person is to have on headset in the final two minutes to make sure everybody knows the situation and when you know the timeout you should be used or when the victory formation should be lined up I think that's going to be important and you know you also got to hope and, and you outlined it so well JJ that when it comes to the the talent acquisition and the roster building that's Mario Cristobal's superpower I mean the guy doesn't sleep and he never stops recruiting you know Miami worked the transfer portal uh, really well in both the January and in the uh, the April transfer portal windows. So the team got a lot more talented. So uh, you increase your margin for error tenfold, right? That it, it's easy to criticize situations and, and decisions that are made when a team is losing, you know, four, five, six games, seven games they lost a couple seasons ago. But, you know, when the talent gets that much better, it also makes your decisions that much better. It's going to be a lot easier, I, th- I think, for Shannon Dawson, the offensive coordinator, to call plays when you have Cam Ward as your quarterback who gives you so many more options. Uh, the same way, I think, situationally, uh, if you've got better players on the field, Mario Cristobal is going to have an easier time managing some of these things down the stretch. Yeah, and, and you said it all. And something that I really liked in there is that two-minute management. I mean, we saw that Oregon even, where – 
They they had a game pretty much in the bag. They lost it. Georgia Tech this year on Miami's home turf. They were undefeated going into that. And then, you know, the fumble and the Hail Mary from the 50-yard line it is something that needs to be improved. And you said it all. You know, they, they have to improve that under two-minute fourth quarter time clock management and how to close out games because that's something important. Uh, and, and, and also, I really liked how you said that. He, Mario Cristobal never sleeps. He's always recruiting, and it, it showed in the transfer portal. You get so many guys. You know, I'll, I'll highlight the offensive guys. You know, Damian Martinez, Cam Ward, as we already mentioned, Sam Brown, um, and, and then on the defensive side, you have Tyler Barron, uh, Simeon Barrow. So you have a lot of players that Miami has got in the transfer portal. It was a top ten transfer portal class, but when you have so many transfers we sometimes see a lack of chemistry within teams. Now with the modern day of college football, it's not as easy to gel. Are you confident as well that this Miami team can gel starting on week one versus UF in a huge game? Yeah, about as confident as I can be until I actually see them play. Um, These guys, they all seem to get along very well, which I think is important. You know, of course, you have to get along both off the field and on the field. But I I think it really starts off the field. You know, there were a certain amount of these players like Cam Ward who arrived in January, then a handful of others like Damian Martinez. And you mentioned Simeon Barrow and Tyler Barron who didn't arrive until uh, May and June. So, you know, you, you've got to get everybody on the same page very quickly. Uh, they do spend a lot of time together, uh, which I think is important. And um, I, I appreciate the way that this group of players has, they've gone the extra mile with extracurricular workouts, right? I mean, every, every college player, you've got a maximum amount of time that's like allowed for official team activities. They, they limit that stuff so that, you know, coaches don't overwork players and, and all that. So there, there's a very strict amount of like official time that they can spend with their coaches. But what, what they do with their free time is up to them. These guys can these guys can get together to throw and catch. They can get together for extra off schedule workouts. They can get together at each other's houses and watch games and do team building activities. There, there's a ton of that stuff going on. Uh, and also, um, I, I think something else that's worth pointing out, JJ, that should help the chemistry learning curve. Uh, is that they were they were pretty strategic talking about Cristobal and his staff in bringing in players that that fit their systems. I mean, in some cases, like the case of Sam Brown at receiver, he played for Shannon Dawson, who's Miami's current offensive coordinator. Played for him at Houston when he started his college uh, career. Uh, in the case of uh, Deani Hill, who's a cornerback that Miami added, he. He played it at Marshall for the defensive coordinator Lance Gidry a couple of years ago. And, and even the players who don't have direct ties to Miami coaches, another one who does have direct ties is Jalen Alderman, a linebacker who played for Derek Nicholson at Louisville a couple of years ago. But even the ones that, that don't have like direct ties with coaches are all guys that they identified as being scheme fits. And so you, you've got to hope that that's going to ease the learning curve. And then the other part of it is I, I know that – Folks can look at you know teams like Miami and a team like Florida State and say, "Wow, well, how are they going to mesh all these transfers?" The crazy thing is, that's so many big programs in America now. You know, I think my, Miami probably they do have more transfers than Florida, for example, to start the season. But like a, a lot of the teams on Miami's schedule this year, teams like Louisville and, and Syracuse that have worked the portal so much that it's like everybody kind of has the same problem where you get a ton of new players and you've got a way to, you got to find ways to figure out how to make it work very quickly. Yeah. And, and also another amazing, you know, you touched on it all, you know, everyone has transfers and everyone has to find ways to gel. As you said, and I do think they did do a good job getting the scheme fit guys that was needed guys that can fit into their system now, I want to touch on something that we touched on with Damian Martinez, but this running back room. You know, it's always important to have a running back room. I would argue it's more important to have a good offensive line because they need to block for the running backs. But Miami ob- arguably has the best running back room in all of college football. Um, Damian Martinez, you got Mark Fletcher and A.J. Allen, and those are players who, you know, you look at running back rooms, they're just going to, they could just run it down defense's throats and, and pick up, 
you know, yardages, pick up short down yardages through that running game. Can you talk about this running back group? That's very special. Yeah, it's very special and it's very deep, and and it's it's deep to the point where uh, sometimes when when I'm doing shows and talking about the running backs, like I, I feel like I, I sometimes leave guys out who could play bigger roles than I give them credit for, and, and all the names you mentioned, and like a guy who uh, who seems to be having a really good fall camp is AJ Allen, who had some very good moments last season, and you know he maybe doesn't get talked about enough because everyone rightfully so is so excited for Chris Johnson's speed. And that's another one. Uh, Chris Johnson is uh, he's got bona fide track speed was setting records in the 100 and 200 in his high school days at Dillard. He's going to get a lot more opportunities to carry this year. And even like Miami's got at least one true freshman. They got two true freshman running backs, but at least one of them, Jordan Lyle, I think is someone who can contribute year one. Uh, he's having a really good fall uh, camp so far for Miami after not even having arrived until June. And so um, I, I think what Miami's done with adding so much talent to their backfield is they have realized that for whatever reason, the last the last two years, you know, 2022 and 2023, that has just been the most snake bit position when it comes to injuries. That even like when you felt like, oh, they've got a ton of guys at running back, how many times, JJ, in the last couple of years did it seem like, well, I mean, like Henry Parrish is like the only healthy guy this week, or AJ Allen is the only healthy guy this week? And then two years ago, they had to give prominent playing time to a former walk on and Lucius Stanley, who they added like in the middle of the season. So uh, I, I think Cristobal and his staff see that. It's like, hey, even when we think we have a lot of talent at running back, our depth has been tested so much the last couple of years when we think we have like three really good ones. Sometimes we'll get down to one or none. Uh, now, this year, they've got five or six really good running backs. So uh, it's also going to help wear down defenses, right? And I, I like the way you said it, that, hey, having the great offensive line is even more important. And they're the ones who are paving those roads and opening up those running lanes for the running backs. But I think Miami has both of those things. Like, you've got what should be a really deep and physical offensive line. And then you've got a running back room that's going to be able to go if you need to five or six guys deep. I think that's a great way to wear down opponents. Yeah. And I would argue being deep is more important than just having the number one guy because injuries are, are a gamble. You never know what could happen with an injury. So that, that's super important. Alex, really appreciate your time. I want to ask you, you know, one, one question on the defense before we go, uh, what position group on the defensive end of the ball? Are you very excited to see from Miami that, you know, could, could stand out. It could be a, a position group like in the secondary safety cornerback or it could be a d defensive line or defensive tackle stuff stuff in that what should we be watching for and, and if it's the secondary should we expect a lot of interceptions from this defense you know I'm I'm gonna say the secondary because that's the group that has the least amount of certainty Right. Because, uh, you know, th th there's some folks out there who think Miami has the best, if not one of the best defensive lines in the country. Uh, I think the linebacker room is going to be really in good shape this year with Kiko Maui Noah and Wesley Besaint headlining that group. But I'm, I'm so interested to watch the defensive secondary because they lost four out of their five starters in that in that backfield defensive backfield from last year. You know, Daryl Porter being uh, the only one who's back, the fifth-year senior cornerback who had a, a very good season last year. He's back for another year. But then the rest of the group is made up of either potential first-time starters or transfers. You know, you have uh, uh, Mish Powell, who transferred in from Washington, who's got very good experience having started in the national championship game last year. He's having a really good camp, but he's never played for Miami before. Uh, you know, you're going to have uh, an increased role this year for Damari Brown, who's in his second year, he might end up being a, either a starting cornerback or a starting nickel. Jadis Richard, who's uh, he's a young, I think he's like a third year sophomore, something like that, transferred in from Vanderbilt last year. He's going to have an increased role this year, could be a starter or a top rotational guy. Robert Stafford, who's heading into his second year. Uh, Diani Hill, who transferred in from Marshall. Like a, a lot of these guys are just... Uh, they're, they're less proven. And then in safeties, Markeith Williams, who's having a really good training camp. He's leading uh, the Hurricanes in interceptions in fall camp. Jaden Harris. Uh, you know, th these guys last year were the understudies for 
Cam Kitchens and James Williams, and now they're going to have more opportunities to play this year. So uh, for me, the defensive secondary, I, I think it's a, it's a room that has like maybe a really low floor with all the inexperience, but also a really high ceiling because we don't really know what to expect from a lot of these guys. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you on that. The defensive line and the secondary are both solid, but we, we haven't seen a lot from, you know, many of these guys. Um, Defensive line obviously being arguably the best in the country but last one here for you Alex you know you got you got the you got this Miami football team which we've touched on a lot we touched on the roster the team but let's look at the actual games the actual schedules and this is no disrespect to the ACC but it's looking a bit weaker this year with the super you know power conferences in Miami schedule you only got one ranked team you know you got really good teams but there's only one ranked team and that's at home that's Florida State so it's a favorable schedule for Miami and that's no disrespect to the ACC it's just how good the Big Ten in the SEC and and somewhat of the the Big 12 have have reloaded added new teams and the ACC they no disrespect but they added Cal Stanford and and SMU and those teams aren't stronger than the other power conference teams we've seen added so obviously you go at Florida and you go at Louisville. Those are probably, I would say at Louisville may be the toughest game of the schedule. They weren't ranked, but you 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 have a favorable schedule. Is Miami going to win the ACC, Alex? And are they going to make the twelve team playoff this year? Oh, I, I think the answer to both those questions is they can. <laughs> um, for all the reasons you stated now they just they, they have to avoid slipping on the banana peels right like you can't you know you can't lose to georgia tech again like you, you definitely can't lose to duke because if you lost to manny diaz that would be super embarrassing like you can't you can't lose on the road at, a, at what should be a pretty good usf team that could sneak up on you if you're not ready for them so but, but it, it, everything you're talking about is true and, and obviously like the the acc it's not it's not the big 10 or the sec Miami still got fortunate within the ACC because, um, you know, by the luck of the draw or the bad luck of the draw, like they could have had NC State on the schedule. They don't. That's one of the better teams. league. They could have had Clemson on the schedule. They don't. They played both of those teams last year in addition to playing Florida State last year. So automatically, I think, you know, Miami avoids two of the other top three teams in the ACC by not having to play NC State or Clemson this year. So that that makes things a little bit more manageable. And, you know, if you look at uh, the expectation for the Hurricanes, it, it's like most people are, are right around 10 wins. You know, I've even seen some very prominent college football analysts like Josh Pate and J.D. Piquel and Joel Klatt all predict 11-1 and one records this year. So if, if they're able to be in the the 10 win range, uh, I think you're you're knocking on the door of a college football playoff spot with the 12 team. If you're an 11 win team, you should you should definitely be in the CFP. It would be it would be hard to think you would uh, you would not get in there with 11 wins this year. So um, it, it's it, it's it's attainable. Now I'll never like JJ. I'll never come on and like guarantee like oh ACC championship or college football playoff because you know my, my Miami has broken my heart so many times over the years. So I. I've definitely got a wait and see approach, but my my official preseason pick um, is ten and two. I think Miami can have that type of a season. They'll they'll probably uh, they'll probably beat a team that maybe they're not supposed to beat, and then they'll probably lose to a team they're not supposed to lose to, and and that's going to be the recipe for getting there. Hundred percent agree with you. And that ten and two, I I think Miami fans would be. Pretty happy with that. That could sneak into a playoff spot. It will definitely get you a, a solid bowl game that are not the New Year's Six Bowl games, which are obviously in the playoffs. But, Alex, I know we went over time. I could talk with you all day. Just really love this conversation. You're really good at what you do. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure most people watching this are Miami fans, so you probably already know Alex with the lockdown cane, so not sure he needs advertising. But at least I'll link his – uh, channel in the description for those very minor audience, the very few audience that likes Miami and doesn't watch Alex and his show. He does a great job over there, and that's daily content on Miami football, basketball, athletics, everything with that. Alex, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, JJ, I didn't even realize we were in overtime because time, time flies when we're talking Canes football. So I, I appreciate the conversation and keep up the great work, man. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Alex, thank you so much for coming on. And now we're going to talk about Miami football. How many games are they going to win? Are they going to make the playoffs? Are they going to make the ACC championship and win it? That's going to all be answered next on the Sunshine State Sports Rundown. So, taking a look at Miami's schedule, it will be right there for you <coughs> on the screen. Or, who Are they going to win? Or are they going to lose? We're going to be talking about that. So, first game is at Florida. And that's going to be a tough game. Obviously, Florida with Graham Mertz. They're a team that is gaining a lot. You know, they, they haven't done well. But I think it's pretty safe to say that to win. Sorry, Isaac, if you're watching. But I think Miami is going to win against Florida on the road. Uh, I think the defense is just overall better on Miami. As Alex said, arguably the best D-line. Then there's going to be wins over Ball State and Florida A&M. So 3-0 for Miami. South Florida. South Florida's a tough one. You're going on the road, but I think they should be able to get that done. Then they should beat Virginia Tech. They should beat Cal. And then at Louisville, I'm going to pencil in a loss at Louisville. Louisville's a really good team. They have a lot of transfers. They have a, they have a top 15 defense, so... You have one loss. Then you beat Florida State at home. I don't love DJ Lee Ungavole, the QB for Florida State. You beat Duke. You beat Georgia Tech. You beat Wake, and you beat Syracuse. 11 and 1. That's my schedule. I went through it really quick. It wasn't in depth or ready. You know, want to wrap this, this up. But that's my thoughts. This was the first episode of the Sunshine State Sports Rundown. I really would really appreciate if you guys left a comment below. What feedback do you have for me? What can I make this show better? What can I do to make it better? Things I could improve on, topics you want me to talk about, anything. If you guys think that I'm not doing a good job, let me know. I'll fix it. So please, give your critiques in the comments. Give your thoughts in the comments. I will be replying to every comment. Make sure you guys leave a like, subscribe. And that's it for now. Thank you for watching the Sunshine State Sports Rundown.